forecaster I ever see out there, I like to A, point out what I got wrong, so I can try and get it right next time, and B, hold myself accountable to that, because no, everybody seems to accept there's this big sort of joke in the economic slash economic media world where everyone goes, well, as soon as you've done a forecast, you've got it wrong. And I sort of see the, the joke behind that, but I don't really think it's an acceptable attitude because this stuff's too important to get wrong. So I put up there, I have this big bugbear about what the, what the media are always talking about, making us think. Um, I think we've had a problem since COVID in that everybody worked out what they probably already knew, which was fear is what gets people to click on stuff on the internet. And so when there was real fear, genuine fear, when we didn't know what was going on with the pandemic, lots of people were doing nothing else. Well, look, everybody who should have been at work was at home anyway, weren't they? So there was nothing else to do. You put a comment up on Facebook at the time and got 600 likes in about two minutes because everyone was on Facebook. And then since then, and we've had fewer crises and things that are called crises and all the rest of it, some of which have been difficult, some which have been a load of fuss about nothing, the media struggle with getting people to click on stuff. So they try and keep you in this constant state of fear. I put their carnage, terror, fire and brimstone. Um, but here's the reality, you know, unemployment at 4.2%, historically in an incredibly low number, economy pretty close to full employment as it goes. Um, there were days when 6% was said to be the number that we all needed to get below and the economy was doing well at 6%, well 4.2 is pretty incredible. Average earnings up 6% year on year. In a normal year, when you looked at that and you'd say, well, inflation is three-ish, we're going to get a, a print which will be not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, which will be around about 2%. Um, some people think it's going to be sort of 2, 2 2.1 is about where people think it'll be. I think it'll be a little bit higher than that, but it will start with a 2 and everyone will start going, well, why is the interest rate still so high? That's what's going to happen. I'll tell you why that's happening. That's happening because the price of energy had dropped dramatically. Why did it drop so dramatically? Because it had risen so dramatically and it's the old what goes up must come down. But it's now come back to a more normalised price in terms of both our gas and our electricity. And that has a big impact on inflation because what's dropping out of the figures from 12 months ago is when things were still very, very high indeed. So 6% earnings, 2% inflation, you'd think people, households, etc., would be very, very happy. A 4% increase on your wages in real terms is massive. Problem with that argument is that people are catching up because prices went first and wages came second and then rents came third. And I think you probably all agree loosely that's what you've seen. Prices of different things went at different, different stages, granted. But actually where we are at today, interestingly enough, you can quite literally throw a blanket over house prices up about 19 point something percent. Inflation's done about 21.7, depending on which measure of inflation you use, but I'm using the main one. Answer that for me, will you? Um, uh, inflation up that, that much um, and rent's pretty much the same, up about 20%. And people aren't really getting their head around the fact that that means, oh, I'm listening to it on the radio this morning, stock market's at an all-time high. Grinds my gears because nobody bothers to say, but money's only worth 80% or, or a bit less of what it was four years ago. So what does it matter? Shouldn't the stock markets all be 22% higher even if they were at the same place they were before the pandemic. But for whatever reason, nobody likes to use this argument, which is good because it means I've got something to talk about, doesn't it? So that's good. But as I say, inflation 3.2, but we know where it's going. But core inflation, for anyone who doesn't know, it strips out the noisy stuff. So it takes out the energy. It takes out the food prices because these things have always been known to be volatile, even when you haven't got wars. Answer that one as well. Um, even when you haven't got wars in the Middle East and all the rest of it, those prices are volatile. So you strip them out to see what does the inflation look like in the economy? Why is that still at 4.2? Well, because services are going up in price. Why are they going up in price? Because they're having to pay people more. What happened during the pandemic? You'll have seen, especially if you read any particularly left wing stuff, companies making record profits. Again, inflation. Right? Put that into real terms context and we can have a sensible discussion around it. But of course, what do companies do when the price of minimum wage goes up, other costs of wages go up, cost of your inputs go up, cost that you deliver your services at goes up. It is the simplest fact of business. Same goes for rentals, as everybody knows. So PMIs are something I bang on about a fair bit. So they're what's called the purchasing managers indices. They give us a real time snapshot of the economy. They're probably my most favourite metric because they are, they print them before the end of the month, in the month that they're talking about. There's intelligent commentary around them. And if you put a graph of the PMIs against the growth of the economy, 
They track each other almost perfectly, apart from when there's a shock, like a global financial crisis or a pandemic or whatever, and then they tend to part company. Why? Because this is surveying the purchasing managers. They buy stuff for big companies. Right, what are they doing? They're looking 12 months into the future. They're looking at their budgets. They're looking at their business development arm and they're saying, right, we need to buy in this in order to sell this. Every business pretty much is trying to grow. Right? When a sudden shock comes, of course, they thought things were going to go fine and then bang, the floor's dropped out of it and that's where the two things part company. But in anything that looks like a non-crisis economy, they're a brilliant, brilliant metric. And 50 is the baseline, so they're asking, so above 50 is expanding, below 50 is contracting. Services print last month was 55, that's pretty high. You know, general healthy historical print would be 52 point something for an economy growing at sort of 2% a year, all other things being equal. Now, of course, all other things are never equal, so I don't know why economists ever say that, but 55 is not a print that says we're going to have a bad second quarter at the moment, bearing in mind we've got half the second quarter left. But generally, generally positive. And if, the reality of our economy these days is if services are doing well, everything's doing fine. Um, there was an interesting bit I put in. If anybody doesn't know about it and doesn't read it, I do a Sunday morning 5,000-word essay because I know everyone's got time for that on a Sunday morning and there's nothing else they'd rather be doing than reading or listening to it. But I did notice the construction PMI had printed a particularly good figure, printed 53, which is very positive because the construction sector's been shrinking. And I thought, blimey, something must have happened and... I don't know what's going on. So that's, that's not in agreement with what I'm seeing on the ground. But actually, what that was about was new work, civil engineering, big commercial projects, stuff that I've got nothing to do with. And I've got no real dog in the fight on that stuff because I'm sticking to the, the smaller end of SMEs and they're not doing very well. House building starts are still down, even though the construction numbers look good, which is why it's important to get into a bit of detail or have a very boring person who's willing to go into that detail for you and come and talk to you about it, like me. So, base rate, we all know, still stayed at 5.25. I have an unhealthy obsession with the members of the Bank of England Committee. I know their middle names, I know their children. I'm godfather to three of them, not, not quite that serious. It's not baby reindeer, but I, I, do, <laughs> I, do, I do take it pretty seriously. I do try and second guess what everyone's gonna do and why, not only at the next meeting, but over the next number of months. Because apart from anything else, there's some seriously important numbers of debt that not only myself, in fact, the last time I was in here, some three guys came up to me that I'd never met before and gave me a litre of Grey Goose vodka, which I don't know what that says about me, but that's what they thought was a nice, and it was a very nice gesture. Why? Because they said they read the supplement and back in 2022, I was saying, look, I'm, I was just saying to Mark, I've broken lots of mortgages since 2022, up to the middle of this year, actually. That was just kind of my best guess. Throw a dart at it, when will things have calmed down? Paid a lot of early repayment charges, and fix them at the old rates of 3 point something percent that we'd all love to see back again now. And they'd done the same, they weren't gonna do anything, they did the same, the loan was 17 million quid, and they said literally the difference was we'd now be on a variable rate of eight point something and we'd be, we'd be bankrupt. So, could have bought me more than a bottle of vodka really when you think about it like that, but no, it was a lovely gesture and it's nice to know that people do read it, they don't just say that they read it to be nice to me when they see me to my face. Um, Five-year gilts and swaps, much more important. If you don't know, that's how the mortgage market is priced. So the base rate can be what the base rate is, and that determines the price of money overnight and over the next sort of three months. And then the bonds, the bond market uses that as a starter, but the further you are away from that one to three month period, the more it's all about the buyers and the sellers in the market. And these markets are seriously liquid. You know, trillions and trillions is traded, you know, I think the global bond market is about 400 trillion quid. It's not a small amount of money. So you can be sure there's some pretty smart people on both sides of those trades. So the five year, five years out, okay, Bank of England set the first three months. The rest of it goes along as it does. Now at 4% money. We were at three and a quarter at Christmas time, which really was a bit of a Christmas present. It's kind of difficult to make money on this stuff unless you get into bond trading, which is, I'm very clear, I'm not a bond trader. I would, I would not made a great bond trader because I get too hacked off when I lose anything apart from anything else. But 3.25 looked too low. I said a couple of weeks back, 4.25 looked too high. We're now back at about four. It probably feels about right at the moment. You start with that 4% and then the banks have to make a margin. They've got costs and they've got profit that they want to make, of course. So that basically translates limited company wise at the moment into about 6% cost of debt. Now, it might manifest itself as 5% with a 5% fee, 
that's the way in which the banks are achieving this. Interestingly, or interesting to me anyway, but interestingly, the margins that they're working to, about 2%, are a lot lower than the margins they were working to back in 2021 when we were getting mortgages at 3%. Because the five-year gilt back then, does anybody want to guess what it was? Sort of March 2021? Five-year gilt price? Five-year gilt yield? Right? Two? Not far off what it is now. 2021? It was zero. It was zero. So you gave the government money and they paid you nothing, effectively, in 2021. Because if you went back to Feb 21, you would see in the headlines, the Bank of England were talking about the fact that uh, we were looking at negative interest rates, potentially. Base was at 0.1. We were looking at negative rates. If you went back and looked at the supplement from early 2021, you'd see one guy saying, there's going to be a lot of inflation coming pretty soon. And you all know what that's going to mean. And, that's, and so it came to pass. But anyway, enough backslapping. So... Best price mortgage rate still 4.32. Now, you see there how low that is compared to the cost of money at the banks. Now, not all the banks have to pay that 4% for the gilt yields because they take money from their savers. And they take it in, especially the big high street banks, at sort of two and a half-ish on average because they've got money on deposit. They've got money on business deposits, which they're traditionally not paying any interest on at all. So their cost of capital is lower, and that's why that 4.32 is nat west. They can afford to do that. But they quite often do those as loss leaders because during the fixed rate period, they know they'll make no money. But they also know that about 30% of people can't be bothered, circumstances change, whatever, don't refix at the end of the term. And if you haven't refixed, there is a, a stack called the BBA rate, which the big banks report on. And the big banks at the moment are reporting the average rate. So what we would call their SVR, their standard variable rate or whatever you want to call it, 7.92 at the moment. So you can see where their margin is. And if they don't have to fix, they don't have a cost, they just have a margin. Because if the, if the base cost of money goes up, they just charge you more. That's what they've been doing. Of course, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, did I hear you correctly when you said there's, there's no link between top rates and base rates? There's not no link because the base rate sets kind of the first three months of the year. So for five year, it, it's a starting point, but it's obviously well below base. And it was 2% below base at Christmas time. You go out to 30 years, there's basically no link. So it, it's about the duration of the bond, yeah, largely. Um, I, I don't know what it was, but it was banks went crazy because the, they, bought, they thought the base rate was going to... When are you thinking of? When Liz Truss was in charge? Yeah. No, so it was after that. It was after that because I was monitoring. So it went weird when Liz Truss, but also I think it was probably around six you, months. So you might be talking about sort of around early July last year. Yeah. The five-year swap was nearly five percent yield. It was, it was uh, well, the five-year swap went over five percent. Went to about five and a quarter, and the five-year gilt was four point nine eight on the yield. So it climbed. So it was, it, was, it was low in February and it went on like near under 3% and climbed to nearly 5%. Now, I know those numbers don't sound massive, right? But in the bond market, that is huge. You can report on the bond market for one week. It's like, what happened? Nothing. Just went, it's just like a flat line. So it's quite rare there's any volatility. So there was some significant, because what, and then what starts to happen is people get worried because the swap rate is basically a market where people will swap a floating rate debt for a fixed rate debt. At the moment, the market, that market's particularly stable because nobody's worried about a big debt bomb going off, right? So while the, the, the guilt rate is four, the swap rate's about 3.9. So it's actually a discount. It's actually lower. People will swap money. So the bank's cost of capital is actually 3.9, right? If there's a big problem or a perceived to be a potentially big problem coming, there'll be a much bigger premium for that debt because what the banks were doing in the middle of last year, because remember the US debt crisis, and stuff like that. Now, really, it was some marginal banks that went a bit funny, and they have a very different system over there where they've got, you know, thousands of banks, and some go bust every year. The only year when no US banks went bust was 2006, and that was a bad sign, not a good sign um, in the end. So that, that was, it put the world of finance on high alert to an extent. And what the, one of the biggest problems was is they didn't have a horizon for saying, we think this is under control. We think that is under control. So they were saying, well, I don't know how far could rates go? And the Bank of England were very, very firm. They were like, base will not go to six. It will not go to six. They wouldn't say why it wouldn't go to six, but they were convinced it wouldn't go to six. 
that suggested to me there was a problem in the system if it got to six. And bear in mind, you know, the government's a big beneficiary of inflation, but it's also, it doesn't want interest rates to be high because it's got so much debt, right? It would rather have a lower interest rate economy. Um, it doesn't keep them up there for, for a laugh. But it, volatility, you know, markets hate uncertainty. And what we've had, you know, we're at the most certain point that we've been since the pandemic. And, and really quite certain in comparison to months where none of these forecasters knew what was going on and didn't know their backside from their elbow. But that is the, the relationship is there, but the, the longer the bond duration, the more tenuous it is, is what I'm saying. So at the moment, you know, the 30 years are up to about 4.8-ish. So the, the, the markets, those very liquid markets believe our average interest rate over the, on debt over the next 30 years will be 4.8%, and that's in the very liquid markets. I can't see how that's true, if I'm honest with you. I just think it's completely wrong, and there are luckily a few half-decent economists who agree with me, um, but that's what the bond markets say. Now, if you don't have a bet on that, you can do, but you might have to wait three years to be right. Um, I've, I'm too impatient for that, to be honest, apart from anything else. Um, so, yeah, new lets still racing away. As I said, rents have really come third in terms of what's been surging upwards. And these things tend to get sticky. Wages are sticky because people are trying to catch up or they're saying, well, minimum wage has gone up 10%. So I'm going to get in 5%. Luckily for most employers, most people don't think in percentages, um, which is very handy. Um, if you employ people, it's not very handy if you're an employee. Uh, but that's where it is. You know, 6% sounds great, but not as good as 10%. They're actually deliberately trying to push the bottom 20% of the income, uh, the income quarter up. Why have the Conservative Party wanted to do that? Because it's quite an interesting phenomenon. One, because they believe in working people and not people on benefits, as you know, ideological stance apart from anything else. But two, it's good business. Because what you don't want is people who are working also claiming benefits. You don't want the state to be paying for that. You want the employers to be paying for that. So actually, they've been quite intelligent with that, even though they've broken a few bits along the way and let's face it there's plenty of stuff they've done wrong so you've got to say some things they've done right um new hmo room lets up nine percent according to the spare room index so hmo even more popular got a lot more popular late 2022 and also massive surge in immigration means you would likely see massive surge in hmo room demand because the average household coming over migrating into the uk is 1.25 people aka can normally four out of five times fit in an HMO room. Uh, and then, as I said, minimum wage, talked about that already, but index link benefits up, pensions up 8.5% thanks to the triple lock. So that is the highest of how much wages go up, um, how much inflation is, um, and 2.5%, and and I believe, is the other part of the triple lock. So a massive 8.5%, huge increase in that, very little fuss about it in the papers because it's the pensioners that buy the papers, so no one wants to tell them off. Um, and LHA rates rebased, so anyone who's got anything to do with LHA or any social housing that's tied to LHA will know. Frozen for four years, that was a hell of a four years to freeze it for, and the average increase is actually at the 17% level, and it's rebased to the, uh, the January 2024 levels, which now, already, four months past, we're probably about 3% ahead of that already. Is that that, that, well, the 17% an average of the national, so because it's collected at the broader rental market like sub-level. So if you ever get involved in LHA and you're a spreadsheet nerd like I am, it's very interesting to see the difference in LHA rates between, say, Birmingham, Coventry and Nottingham, because Nottingham's are way more generous, even though, the, even though the properties... Well, I think it's... I, I don't know who lets some of these rooms at, at some of the prices. They, if you go into the data, you can actually see every single put and there's sometimes not many in birmingham there'll, there'll be a lot because it's a huge area obviously um biggest council in europe and all the rest of it but there are some parts of the country where 30 people have submitted their rents and they're setting it off the ninth rent in that 30. pretty phenomenal if i had a portfolio focused in one area you can guarantee i'd be submitting my rents that's for sure so inflation that's what the uh, this is this is very much sort of what you want for, uh, can't see the red thing on the screen, never mind. It obviously bounces off. But normally you would see that very flat. This is very typical COVID graph. Everything looks flat compared to what happened before and then suddenly something massive goes on. So CPIH is what includes housing costs. It's what the Office for National Statistics prefer. 
CPI is the, the inflation rate that the Bank of England are told by the government to get down to 2%. Now, whilst on that subject, we've got a problem, right? And I'm, by that, I mean the world has got a problem. Historically, after pandemics, there is inflation. Historically, this sort of inflation can embed itself within the system for up to 30 or 40 years. That's what all the old data tells us. And it is old because the last proper pandemic was the Spanish flu 100 years ago. But they've always collected this sort of data. So some, when I looked into this stuff, it goes back 500 years. And obviously there were more serious pandemics in terms of the percentage of the world's population that it killed. And people said, oh, no, 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 this is what they always do, which is a mistake. It, forget about history. That's a silly thing to do because we had a very similar impact. The labour force shrank massively, right? Why? Is it because everybody died? Because that's what it was like in the Black Death. Everyone's dead, so they can't work, right? Understandable. Fair enough. Some employers would still expect you to turn up, of course, but <laughs> understandable, right? It, everyone wasn't dead, but they were suddenly awakened or had loads of savings or decided to do something else or whatever. And there was this thing that we called the Great Resignation, because we're very British about these things. And in the States, they called it the Big Quit. People decided it wasn't bloody worth it anymore and decided to quit their jobs. So the labour force shrunk massively. How have we actually responded to that? No one ever has this conversation in public. Mass immigration, because we've needed people to fill jobs, because the economy's been reflating itself, right? But no one politically wants to say that because it might get them in trouble. And then this third line here, this, uh, the darker blue line that's just going up and up and up, you have to be careful with that because it's what's called a synthetic measure. So it's not real but it's the Office for National Statistics best estimate at owner-occupier's housing costs. So we sometimes forget, you know, as a little bit of revision, 36% of all the households in the UK own their home, no mortgage. Right, that's the biggest group that there is, 36%. 28% have got a mortgage, right? So they're the owner-occupier's housing with mortgage. And that, we know those mortgages loosely have gone up probably about 50% if those people have dropped off their fixed rates loosely. The Bank of England threw a figure out there. Their methodology was pretty good, I think, and it was 250 quid a month. That's what they estimated in the sort of middle of last year, around that time when the rates were actually really quite high. So I think that was a roughly a, a pretty good guess. And when you put it into context of, well, it's 250 quid a month. I mean, that's not great for anybody, but I thought you said the sky was falling. That's less than the gas bill went up in the winter of 2022. Now, admittedly, we had the price cap, but it still capped it at a very, very, we still had 1,000% inflation in gas prices to deal with, which is incredible. Luckily for us, a lot of, I mean, most people don't know. Do you know how much a, a kilowatt of electricity costs at cost price? So not distributed, not to your house. So do you know what a kilowatt of electricity costs roughly to buy? Has anybody fixed their energy costs recently? How much is a, a kilowatt of electricity, you know, Resi-wise, about 25p, right, about 25p. What's the system price of electricity a month ago? Have a guess. Six. Two. It is six now, interesting. It's gone right back up, but that's sort of where it's at. Now, this was historically sort of two or three p a kilowatt and has, has, has floated around a bit down to one. During 2022, it went up to like 25, 30p a kilowatt. So the, that, that inflation is 1,000%. But we didn't see all of that because to distribute it costs the same money plus inflation. And all the other, the infrastructure costs don't change as much as quickly, but that's what they cost. Now, of course, the other problem we've got at the moment is we need to pile the world of money into the grid in order to upgrade it for all these electric cars that China are either going to flood the market with or get stopped from flooding the market with because we're going to put a load of tariffs on them, which is a very topical, according to Donald Trump, 60% tariff. Uh, that's what's happening. Um, but some people suggest the tariffs would need to be 100% to make European electric cars competitive. Otherwise, everyone will be driving around a BYD. Anyone here got a BYD? Anyone seen one on the road? There's a few out there now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, cheap. Super, it's the China, either bigger than Tesla. Biggest electric car maker in the world now. There you go. Yeah, yeah. So, you're... You heard it here first. Uh, I'm just yeah. at the minute. I'm waiting for my mini to run out. <laughs> Good stuff. But look at that owner-occupier housing metric. Like, on the rise, on the rise, on the rise. It's still going upwards, right? So this is the cost of owner-occupiers in households. Why is that important? 
right? Because if they're spending their money on maintaining their household, they can't spend it on other stuff. And that's how the gross domestic product of the UK is largely measured. How much of it is consumption, right? There's two things that can stop you consuming, or three things really. One, tax, right? But then the government spend it anyway. And the government are always spending more than they bring in, right? So tax is one. Two is savings, and there's been a much bigger prevalence, especially in the older generation, of going back to saving. Because finally, just like it used to be before 2008, you can get 5% or 4% in the building society again. And some people think that's worthwhile doing. So that, that's also negated consumption. And the other one is you can't afford to because you've got to spend it on essentials. So I'm talking about spending on non-essentials versus essentials or technically what an economist would call luxuries. But that includes anything you don't need to buy. So pretty, pretty, pretty big list, really. There's the five year guilt. That's the period that we were sort of talking about there when we're knocking that sort of uh, 5% headroom ceiling. Um, I, I really only care about the five year. I've been a big proponent of doing five year mortgages for a long time. One, because a lot of mine I've done individually. So it's an incredible amount of legwork. It's not because I'm an idiot, although I am an idiot, but that's not why. Um, that is because I wanted to try and hedge exposure to the interest rate. And also because the terms on individual five-year mortgages are like Bambi compared to the terms on a portfolio loan, which when you read deep, you see they can ask you to revalue it at any time. They can ask you to post capital. They, none of that happens when you go to Foundation or Precise or Fleet or Paragon or whoever. They just a five-year swap transaction, bang, you're done. Pay your mortgage, not going to have any problems. So I very deliberately wanted to have my cake and eat it, of course. And so I wanted those terms, but I wanted them across hundreds and hundreds of loans. And that's what I've done. Now, I, I changed that because in early 22, when I broke all that debt, I was going out two and a bit years. So I created myself a cliff edge problem for sort of 2027. Now, how much of a problem is that? Because they can't come after me and get that debt back. Well, unless I'm not paying, of course, but assuming that I'm paying, they're not going to come after me until 2027 and I'm not in any trouble. So I need to start thinking about maybe at the start of 2026, how many of these am I going to keep? How many am I going to refinance? Where are we going to be at at that type of point in time? If you believe the 18-year property cycle, which I don't, and I use the word believe very deliberately because it is a belief thing, not a fact thing, um, then you would think 2026 is going to be a crash and they'll build these problems. But I'm very happy to go on record. That's utter hogwash. Um, net migration, I mentioned, that just puts it into perspective in terms of the scale of where net migration has been. That's till 2022 which is the last year we've got full figures for. There have been a few changes last year, which are going to get things down, apparently, best estimates to sort of 450,000 a year. But as you can see, we'd never even gone above 400,000 a year before. What does it mean? Why do we care? 90 plus percent of people who come to the UK have to rent. They're not in a position to buy, and they're not in a credit position to buy. So... Probably the, the Hong Kong intake has been quite a rarity, but even most of the Hong Kong intake that I've seen have come in and, and, and rented, and rented for 12 months, knowing that they will then go into a property they can purchase. They come over with an average of 350 grand in net assets per person. So they're not poor, but they also want to figure out suss out areas and they don't want to make a big decision. Um, and also interestingly, quite a few are interested in prop investing in property in the UK. So they come and move to South Birmingham, South Manchester, whatever, and then go and buy properties up in Liverpool or typical sort of yield chasing buy to let stuff. So I know quite a few people who are working with the, the, the Hong Kong demographic that have moved into the UK and helping them buy houses. But that's where we are. And you imagine we haven't put lots of houses on. In fact, the housing starts thing, we haven't really even felt the pain of the pandemic yet because it takes time for housing starts to slow down. They're still slow, they slowed down. There was a big surge before, it was June, I think last year, wasn't it? When they changed the, the, uh, some of the building regs. And so they front loaded a lot of stuff, got it, got it up to damp course, got it signed off. And then we had a massive drop off in Q3, Q4. That was combined with the swap rates, combined with everything else. So all you read about construction is the moment is supply is easing which means people are struggling to find jobs doing it and it's not like it was and materials prices have calmed right down. Of course, they're always volatile because a lot of them are based on commodities, but we've seen our, just like the electricity and the gas, thousand percent spike. We've seen that, we've dealt with it, it's over. We're back to a much more normal, in inverted commas, marketplace that still moves up and down. This is my favourite. If I had a favourite metric, don't tell the other metrics because I don't want to get jealous. 
But if I did have a for like households, well, it's households that rent stuff. So I don't do a lot of HMO, and the ones that I do are generally social, so they're on a lease to a provider. Um, but it's households that rent property. It's not people, right, as far as the stats go, because the stats don't care about people, remember. Disposable means the taxman's had his or her slice already, and this is what they've got left, and income is what they pay their rent with. So you, I couldn't imagine a better metric if I tried, to be honest. Um, and this is where it's at. And, but the, the broad point is, when it's below the line, when it's, so you can see these points here, where it's below that zero centre line, things are going backwards. Not just for people, but for households. So households are getting worse off. How can that happen? number of different ways. One, inflation can be really high, and wage increases aren't keeping pace. That's what you would ascribe to that bit there, right? 2021, and most people get the timelines completely wrong. This is when the cost of living crisis started there, right? It's Q3 2021 when we went below the line. But people didn't notice because inflation is invisible and it's difficult for people to get their head around and understand, even professional commentators. I think you know what happened in that one, right? So I probably don't need to dwell on that one. What about that one? Why, why, did, that, why did we go below the line there? Q3 2016. Well done, referendum. And, but why, so one level down, why did we go below the line? Because inflation went up. Why did inflation go up? Because the exchange rate fell apart. And because we import so much stuff, it affected inflation. So real terms wise, we weren't ready for that. And therefore households dropped. It would have looked a lot more like, I mean, look, we haven't set the world on fire 17, 18 and 19, but neither, has, neither have we gone to hell in a handcart. But you can sort of see where we are now since Q3 20, ironically, since the worst bit, Q3 2022, we've actually gone above the line quite a bit. And with wages at six and inflation at about to be two, like I said to you, or two and a half, it's going to look pretty good because in real terms, households are moving forward significantly in real income. Just bear in mind, your tenants never put their hand up. If anyone's ever had a tenant like this, do let me know. But I've never had a tenant yet phone me up and say, great news, massive pay rise. Do what you want to me. <laughs> right? so, but you do need to, know, you need to know how things are going in the real world as a general rule to, to look at. Because when you look at some of your rent increases this year, assuming you're increasing your rents every year, which if you're not by now, I don't know how you're still in business. But assuming you are and think, oh, that looks a bit punchy. Just remember this chat, right? It's all punchy. It's all been punchy. Rents are going last. You've already had to pay higher mortgage payments, or if you haven't yet, you need to start building a war chest for when you do. We just refinanced the property. Where we're, deli we're delighted. We're delighted that we got a special rate of 7.09% on the latest social housing, and it's a refinance, right? Now, this is on an RPI-linked lease. So the, the rent's gone up with RPI, which is up about 30% over the last five years, right? Current mortgage is 250 quid a month. The rent when they went in was about 900-ish or something. We're, about, we're up to nearly 1,200 now, thanks to that. And when we go on to the new mortgage, we're going to be, oh, admittedly, we're pulling out about 20 grand or something. So we are paying on a bit more. But if, if, the, if the amounts on the mortgage were equivalent, then instead of paying 250, we'd be paying 500. It's literally double because we're going from three and a half to seven. And it's interest only. It doesn't work like that for the resi market, remember, because they're paying capital and interest. So the capital doesn't change, but the interest, the interest does. I, th I think you've got to remember, ultimately, if it stacks up today, it's very likely to stack up in five years' time. Now, I have a mentality of doing lots of deals. I want to do lots more deals in the next five years. So I want to get that done out of the way. Does it work at 7.09, whilst I'm joking, at my special favourable rate that I'm getting? Um, does it work? Yeah, it does. It still works. Still cash flows about the same as it did back in 2019. Is that great news? Not really, because 2019 money was only worth 80% of 2024 money. But are we still in business? Yes, we are. Jolly good. Right. Have we got another five years of RPI linked rent increases in that lease? Yes, we have. When we come out in 2029 out of that five year fix, am I going to fix a 7.09 or lower? I'm going to guess lower. Right? I'm pretty sure it's going to be lower. I'm 95% certain it will be lower. So we'll then be in a stronger position then. So sometimes it's just about playing the waiting game. You know it's a long game. If it still stacks, great. If it doesn't, get rid of it. Or do something with it that makes it stack. HMO it, whatever you need to do. Well, not whatever you need to do. Don't do anything illegal, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, this, this, is going to look pretty, this is going to look pretty good for Q. The, the problem with the ONS is they're a bit slow. right? So this is Q4 2024. This is the most up-to-date they've got. We've got to wait till the end of next month to get Q1. But I can already tell you roughly where it is. 
because wages have been increasing loads and inflation has not been anywhere near as bad. Average inflation for Q1, you know, 3.5%-ish. Average wage increase about 6.1%. So I can say all other things being equal. Now, what else is going to impact this upwards is the old last ditch, last hurrah, take 4% off national insurance to try and win the election, right? We all know it's not going to work, right? It's worth a try. <laughs> it's worth a try. I can tell you, Sunak and Hunter are sitting there at the moment going, we're brilliant. You know, 0.6% growth in Q1. It's a, and it is, it's a great result for this economy based on it having been through a pandemic. Top growth in the G7. But if they think for a minute that the voting public is going to give a damn about that, I'm afraid they're bloody kidding themselves. I think, that, I think Jeremy Hunt's done okay, but it's not my opinion that anybody cares about, so... So, numbers, 1.3 million, that's the, the net migration within the last two years up to the end of 2023, or the middle of 2023. 1.25, that average household I told you about. 6%, that's your average cost of debt at the moment, based on that 4% swap rate. I don't care whether you've got the fees or not, really. It helps with your cash flow, but you're paying it. You're paying it from somewhere. Am I willing to pay 5% fee out of my next five years' capital growth at the moment? Yes, I am because I think it's going to be 25%. Lucy and Cook, who is one of the more miserable forecasters in property, works for Savills, even he thinks it's going to go up 22% in the next five years. So I'm going 25% plus. Why am I so bullish? One, we're below the long-term trend line now. And COVID, of all the things that have increased in COVID, property prices are the least at this point out of the things we should be caring about. But nobody listens to that because they want more headlines about, oh, Properties are at record prices. Rents are at record levels. Wages are at record levels. Do you want to make a headline out of that? No, okay. Don't worry about it. 21,000 minus 21,000. That's the number of HMO rooms we've theoretically lost, according to Octane Capital, in the past couple of years. I'm not sure how they collect their figures. or there's not, there's, It's very opaque, their data, so I can't really comment on it. But at least they have a go and nobody else does. So if that's the best we've got, that's what we've got. Spare room would be the the Bible if they publish that sort of stuff, but I guess they don't for business reasons. Um, an 8.1 average yield of an HMO, and obviously around here, you can do an awful lot better than that. So you can see you've got your costs under control, or if they're social or whatever, there's still margin in the game. It still stacks at 6%. Last month, uh, the Bank of England produced a report every month about the, the, the money supply and credit in general. What that normally filters through to in the headlines is how many mortgages were there, which is, which is a good barometer. You know, it, it runs about... A month late, this report does. So how many more mortgages were there? They did in March. All right, 60 odd thousand. Pretty good. Over 60,000 is pretty normal. The normal market that we all theoretically remember, 2017 to 2019, they were doing about 65 to 70,000 a month. So that's roughly where we're at. They also talk about how many remortgages they're doing. But in that report, there's a lot more about lending and borrowing and where we're at. So the net borrowing by businesses so this would be for new projects. It wouldn't be because they had an old loan expire and that to take out a new loan, because that would, would create no net business, right? That'd be one takeaway the other. This is net new lending was up to the highest level it's been for years, eight billion quid in March. Now that's money going into new projects at leverage. And that means businesses can make 6% or thereabouts, depending on the size of the business. They can make that rate work for them, for new projects that they're taking on. And they'd rather do it at 6% debt than raise equity which is their choice. So, you know, obviously we're talking about some of the biggest, we're talking about all the big companies in the economy. So, hold on a second, right? What about all this debt? Now, again, we should be adjusting that debt for inflation, which we never do. So we do need to bear that in mind. Is there a fiscal drag? That is just when basically, because you've got a lot of payments to make, anyone who's got a bounce back loan in a company that isn't doing that much, we may or may not have taken more than one bounce back loan when that time came. I can assure you that we followed the rules to the letter. Uh, some of those are in companies that are a bit boring and not doing that much. Is there a fiscal drag in those companies on their performance just paying back that bounce back loan? Yeah, there is, because that money's going back. And mostly it's repaying capital, which is problematic because the company makes a profit, HMRC take their slice, then you pay repayment capital. Interest only, that's the whole point, right? At least it comes off the tax bill. So there's a fiscal drag. What does that mean? It means that we can't reinvest within those companies because we're servicing the debt. Government doesn't work distinctly different from that, apart from the fact they nearly have an unlimited supply of debt, but the international markets keep them in check. You know? So there is, there is fiscal drag, but that's it. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled is convincing the world he didn't exist. That's what inflation's all about. And pretending that the government are upset about inflation is a silly thing to do because they've got all this debt. They'd love it to get 
you know, inflated away. That's the, be the best way to get out of it would be massive increase in productivity and basically repeat of the 50s, 60s and 70s. Well, not the 70s because <laughs> financially it wasn't ideal. But basically, you know, lots of house price, crea lots of house um, new, new unit creation, lots of economic growth, big GDP figures. Um, we're not in that world at the moment, although I do have a, an argument that Apart from anything else, lots of people look back to 2007 like it was some kind of lighthouse barometer moment when really, if you were in markets in 2007, whether it was property or not, there was a lot of bullshit going on. Right, there was stuff getting valued at money it was never supposed to be valued at. There were pay rises that never should have been happening. There was so much fake money in that economy. So if you accept all those figures as correct from sort of 05, 06 and 07, we don't look very good compared to that. But my argument is those figures were wrong. And this is why, even when we had the financial crisis and all the credit was withdrawn and the market only lost about 15, 16% overall, that's an incredibly low number because a lot of the stuff that was on the land dredge was sold at 100 grand, built by a developer who gave it to you for 85 and gifted you the deposit of 15, which nobody ever saw or paid. So really, it only tra transacted at 85. So if that was then sold at 50 grand, it wasn't a loss from 100 to 50, it was a loss from 85 to 50. And that obviously was not every house that transacted. But what I'm saying is there was fraud in that marketplace that overinflated figures and gives us too positive a view of how great 2007 was. Quite a few people were running around in 2007 going, something feels wrong. Not sure what it is, but something feels wrong. Um, and yeah, the carbon monoxide bit. So we, we know, or if we don't know, you'll know now, tax thresholds, personal tax thresholds are frozen until the 2028-2029 tax year at the moment. Presuming we have a change of government, are Labour going to turn around and say, oh no, we don't think that's very fair? I don't think they are. Actually, the Conservatives have got incredible form for increasing those thresholds over this Parliament because that comes back to the point of they want people at the lower end of the spectrum from an income perspective to be able to support themselves and not rely on benefits. And half of that is ideological thinking, teach people to look after themselves. And half of it is good commercial business sense. But that's where we are. That currently, the higher rate tax limit will still be £50,240. Not that I'm bitter at all. Until 2028, 2029, which is ridiculous. Because by then, nearly every bugger will be on 50 grand a year. You know, minimum wage will be 30 grand a year by then if, if we go on at the rate we're going. So, positive impact this time around. Interest rates went up. People had longer term fixed debt. They had savings, they had liquidity. That wasn't fixed into bonds because there was no point fixing it into bonds at 0.8% or whatever. So suddenly they found they were getting a return on this money. Great news, people had more money, but also people had income tax to pay on that money. So a bonus for the government. No one had really factored that into any of the, uh, the commentary they were talking about. And then it was one of those things they sort of saw in the rear view mirror and said, that's interesting, that extra six billion quid's worth of tax that we pulled in or whatever. Um, and the soft landing, well, that's the, the technical term for what they're trying to achieve in that there's an acceptance that what you can't really do is blow up the economy in a massive way, pump a load of money in there, some of which gets misappropriated or whatever, some of which finds its way into the property market quite a bit, as it turned out, and then just suddenly expect everything to be fine. You have to try and land the plane to get back to a more normal economy. And a soft landing is something that accepts there might be a couple of bumps in the road along the way. Sounds quite realistic and quite romantic. Probably about 40% probability of it at the moment. Uh, one, of the, one of the other probabilities being no landing, which is, very, which is very hopeful, which is just like, nothing to see here, we'll just get on with it. Nothing to worry about. Adam should just shut up. I don't know why he bothers wasting all his time looking at this stuff because nothing's going to go wrong. I think we all know that's probably not going to happen. And then hard landing which is nobody saw something coming, a little bit like the Liz Trust situation where you had all this uh, liability-driven investment in pension funds, which nobody knew what it was beforehand. Reminded me a lot of the old 2008 CDOs, uh, credit default swaps, collateralised debt obligations, all these words we still don't really understand, but we definitely didn't understand them then because we'd never heard of them. Same for LDI, but basically pensions were trying to borrow money in order to make more money because the returns were so low on the gilts they were investing in at the time. And the Bank of England missed the fact that there was a trillion pounds worth, a trillion pounds worth of these funds, which when the prices started going wrong, they were getting these calls, which were effectively called margin calls, where they're like, right, you've got to put money in. We need, we need 500 million today 
in order to stem the flow of that because your, your leverage ratios are out of kilter. So if anybody's ever tried to trade options, crypto, things on credit, leverage, that's how it works. Leverage is great while things are going up and terrible while they're coming down. That's why it works quite well in property because things tend to go up quite slowly, quite boringly, and are quite safe. So this is just to me to check that I'm not kidding myself. Um, as I said, I spend far too, an unhealthy amount of time slagging off other forecasters and trying to do a better job myself. At the start of 2023, that's what we had. Savills minus 10, as I said. Uh, my, my friend being particularly uh, bearish as usual. Knight Frank said minus five. Capital Economics, who sell very high level consultancy to lots of financial organisations around the world, minus 12. Halifax minus eight, OBR minus nine. Proponomics, man in his bedroom, here I am. Uh, I said minus three to minus five. Why was I so unbearish? Number one, because I think everybody forgets that inflation does a lot of legwork. Number two, because when you have a market like a 2008 and you still only see the market go down 16 or 17%, it's the magnitude of the factors. What, what were we going to go through in 2023 that looked anywhere near as bad as there's no mortgages? I mean, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad, right? 